All that remains of Charles Humphrey's promising career as a student athlete fits inside this plastic bag. We were another football where all the teammates. His parents tenderly hold these keepsakes and marvel at just how close their son came to being a success story. I just wanted him to graduate uh, high school. Sometime I could be walking, just tears just come. You know, some, losing him, I guess I lost a part of me. He was the kid from the housing projects who was about to make good. The star running back and captain of his high school football team and the most popular kid in Norfolk, Virginia to boot. Everybody who knew him affectionately called him Little Charles. His coach, John Quinterly, says on the field and off, everyone wanted a piece of number nine. After every game, a coach would come shake your hand. he said, Coach, who's that number nine? That guy's a stud. In just a few months, Little Charles was set to graduate with a college football scholarship. He'd be the first in his family to go to college. So one day my mama get you out of here. That's my dream. I said, okay, baby. But Charles's mother recalls a sinking feeling while her boy was growing up here, because Norfolk, Virginia and the surrounding area are more than meets the eye, more than a collection of picturesque seaport towns. Behind the postcard image lies an inner city besieged by gangs, guns, and fear. Every day of this life, when you wake up in the morning, you'll kiss me, you'll hug me, and then when you leave out the door, say, see you later, Mom. So okay, baby, be careful out there. Why did you feel it was necessary to say, be careful out there? I just know how the world is. And then three months ago, Linda Humphrey gave her youngest child, Charles, her final warning about the way of the world. That night that it happened, I called him on the phone and I said, baby, it's time to come home. And he said, mama, I know I'm getting ready to come home now. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll see you when you get here. And that's when we received a phone call about maybe 20 minutes later that he was dead. I couldn't believe it. That's the last time I smoked with my son. Little Charles's drive to make it out of poverty ended here, with a single shotgun blast to the face, apparently not even meant for him, fired by a reputed gang member from a car after a neighborhood party turned violent. There are more and more of these makeshift memorials throughout this part of Virginia. From last spring to January, when Charles was murdered, seven local athletes have been gunned down, five of them killed. I got a phone call after the third game of the season that one of my players, Rayshawn Finney, had been shot. The phone rang, and she finally told me what had happened, um, that Lonnie had been shot in the back. I received an email from one of my uh, assistant coaches uh, telling me that Kevin had been shot. Where Dante was hit in the shoulder, which hit his artery, and you know, you know, from there, you know, he just bled to death. Darius was shot outside of a, a nightclub. He, he was like a son to me. These seven men coach high school football in this part of Virginia, where all the players were from. While two of the victims were shot outside the area, the impact of all seven shootings has the players' hometowns reeling. Sports is still seen as a way out of hardship here, if young players can stay alive in the process. Imagine you guys are all sort of wondering what the heck is going on around here. Are you not? Every day. Part of the job description is not grief counselor, but I imagine you've had to take on that role. You're going to find yourself talking less about X and O's, more about life, about making choices, just daily living. Because a lot of times, we're the only ones they're getting it from. These victims, they were popular, they were successful. Most of them had college scholarships waiting for them if they hadn't accomplished that already. Is there an envy, a jealousy factor here? You're getting up and out. Oh, no, you don't. What happens is, you know, they walk into the party and they've just scored a few touchdowns and everybody's, you know, hitting them on the shoulder saying, hey, you did a great job. And all of a sudden, by mistake, they bump into somebody. Now the guy's upset, says, man, he, he, he thinks he's all that out. I'm going to show him. Some people might ask, and some have asked, oh, what were these kids mixed up in? They must have been running with the wrong group. To the best of your knowledge, were any of your athletes affiliated with gangs? 
Everybody in our schools probably knows gang members and knows who they are. And they might even be associate and be friendly with them, but they don't run in that same circle. Unfortunately, these days, you can be a good kid, a good athlete, and bad things can happen to you by other people, and that's, that's the reality and that's the truth. No one here doubts the reality of gang and gun violence in the small cities of Virginia. The state's attorney general has launched this chilling public awareness campaign. Every time I go to sleep, I hear so like, pow, pow. And in Norfolk, the police department has recently doubled the size of its anti-gang unit. Are they in school, out of school? No, they're adults. You got warrants for them? No. no. It estimates that this city of 230,000 people includes about 2,000 gang members in 60 different organizations, the majority of whom are juveniles. One such alleged gang member, 17-year-old Terry Cherry, has been charged with the shooting death of little Charles Humphrey. Remember that all well. At Humphrey's memorial service, school board member Billy Cook decried Norfolk's creeping culture of gun violence. You got a gun just to protect yourself? You're not helping the rest of us who are simply trying to live a normal, everyday life where a black young man can walk down the street and not worry about getting shot in the head. Billy Cook's wife, Sharon, is a teacher at the high school Charles Humphrey attended. Here is yet another young, promising African-American male shot down, you know, in the prime of his life, so to speak, and we've had enough of this. I was thinking of putting y'all in groups. In her classroom, Sharon Cook has even created what she calls a wall of pain. On it are the photos of students like Lil Charles, many of whom she has taught over the years, both victims and perpetrators of violence. You're a teacher at a high school. You're supposed to have pictures of Martin Luther King and George Washington, right. and instead you've got a wall my of pain. Own, yep, my corner wall. And I even have students who'll come up and say they have a picture. Can, that, can I bring my picture and put on the wall? Sure, honey. Because this is the reality. Yeah. Yep. And I don't want my kids to see this as this is just normal every day. But it's becoming pretty normal. I don't care how many kids are murdered. It's not normal. And there's another boy on the wall, a young athlete named Cal, Sharon and Billy Cook's own 14-year-old son. Now it's even more real because it's happened to my kid. That's my kid. It was a lazy Friday evening in a neighborhood that looks like Pleasantville when the phone rang in the Cook's home. And she said, Miss Cook, you've got to come out here right now. Cal's been shot. So then panic sets in. Billy, Cal's been shot. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. And I jump out the car and I look down at the ground and I'm like, is that my baby's blood? Is that his blood? It, I mean, it was bleeding as if someone had opened a small faucet. Finally, I hear him call out to me. I'm okay. You know, but that's still no relief for me because I'm like, somebody shot my son. Sorry, Cal. Cal recovered from his wounds and is back on the playing field. At the moment, Mrs. Cook is struggling to keep another boy off the wall of pain, a student who wants to get out of a gang. How do you help him get out? What do I say to him? You know, I told him you don't have to do it. I need a resource though. I need somebody to tell me what to tell these kids. That's what I need. A photo of Charles Humphrey's mother is on the wall too. What she needs is justice. I guess my heart won't be right until they find get all of them that was in their car that night. The Humphrey family believes other men involved in their son's murder are still at large, but the prospects for justice are unclear. Because while they are convinced that numerous eyewitnesses who can implicate Charles as killers came out for his funeral, the family says none will come forward to police. When we came out to church at the funeral, it was about like 2,000 people out in the street. You looking at men about 50 like me, they crying, little boys crying, little girls crying, everybody was crying. No, but, but nobody, did, they ain't saying nothing. But on the streets, Charles Humphrey's killers seem to be an open secret. Everybody knows. The family says this man is the only person to voluntarily come forward to tell police what he has heard about Lil Charles's killers. 
Well, man, the streets talk like... The streets talk. You know, it's like the internet out here when everybody talk. He's asked us to conceal his identity out of concern for the safety of his family. Because I know the shooter, and the shooter knows me. Is that the culture that if somebody comes forward and talks, that puts somebody at risk? No. Yeah. Uh, here they call it snitching, they got, and they live by that stop snitching code. So why are you talking to us? What happened was not supposed to happen to the person it happened to, because he wasn't into all this gang stuff and all that. He says he was not there the night Charles was killed, but has given police the names of suspects who he says have been hiding in plain sight because would-be witnesses will not come forward. I told them what I heard on the streets and without eyewitnesses, that don't help at all. Was there one person who shot him? How many people were in the car? But from what I heard, it was four people in the car, but only one person shot him. And they're affiliated with a gang? Yeah, Bloods. Bloods. And the very same day Real Sports spoke to this informant, the cycle of violence and silence continued. He says one of the men involved in Charles Humphrey's shooting had just killed another man. You're telling me that one of the guys that was involved in the shooting of little Charles, that everybody knows about, that 200 people at a party knew about, but because nobody would come forward, has just today killed somebody else. Struck again. That's crazy. That's bananas. The latest victim, a young father, is also a former student of Sharon Cook's. More pain for her wall. Darius Walton, Kevin Whaley, mm -hmm. your son Cal Cook, mm -hmm. Dante Newsom, Bonnie Andrews, Rashawn Finney, Charles Humphrey. And you said, I am sick and tired mm -hmm. of being sick and tired. How tired are you? You know, that's the, that's the thing. We can't give up. We cannot let 1% of this community, we can't let 1% run us out of this community. In some respects, this is a counterinsurgency battle, which means that the enemy is among us. The minority has the majority now living in fear. And that's the thing that we gotta recognize. We gotta recognize that we outnumber those who, who don't wanna do right.